I... <laughs> Get out of here. Maybe don't put this on the internet. I'm being a uterus. I just don't put it as the thumbnail. It's not the thumbnail, okay? People are going to think you're a member of some sort of cult. <laughs> So it is Elizabeth, aka Nurse Zabe, here on YouTube and Instagram, back again with another video for you. For those of you who are new to my channel, I am a labor and delivery and postpartum nurse and a certified childbirth educator. And I today have a video for you that's kind of, it's going to be a little bit fun, a little bit funky, but also a whole lot of educational. And it is the 10 weird, cool, interesting things that your labor nurse wants you to know about labor. During these difficult times that we are with, um, I know I had a lot of really sad response and a lot of scared and anxious response to my last video. And I want everybody to know that I hear you and I see you. I'm doing my best to reply to comments on that. Um, and we are all overwhelmed and everything I said in that video still pretty much stands true. We just need to be alert but not panicked and calm and just realize that as the situation is evolving policies and procedures are going to evolve to help protect moms and babies and healthcare workers as well so after that video being that it was heavy i wanted to do something a little bit fun hence this video kooky weird things so i'm gonna start off with one and some of these y'all might know, and some of them you might not, but either way, they're great talking points, great educational points. I want to start off with one that I'm guessing most of you don't know. Because some people like to send, save the juicy stuff till the end, and we have juicy stuff for the end, so don't click away. But I want to put this little morsel right in the beginning so you're like, I see you, I hear you. That's crazy. Elizabeth, that's crazy. And it is called for lack of a better term, because I haven't found a technical term, the purple butt line. Purple butt line. Now Elizabeth, you might be saying to yourself, why are you talking about purple butt lines? Well that is because this purple, blue, dark, kind of depending on tone line that comes up from the anus up through the natal cleft, which is your butt cleavage that or there's a technical term for that um will in 80 ish percent of women plus be present and coincide with the dilation of your cervix and the station how far in your birth canal the baby is okay so this is a way that we can or i do at least in my practice and patients who who are laboring without medication i use this line this visualization to help me better picture where we are in our labor process and as i see this line getting longer i'm thinking i'm liking this this is a good sign so why do we have this purple butt line? It has to do with the blood flow in that sacral area in relation to having a baby's head right there. Um, there's going to be some congestion of the blood flow, which gets more and more increased as that fetal head comes down into that area, which is why this line correlates with station and dilation. So this can be a way that we as clinicians can assess what's going on without frequent unnecessary bacteria introducing vaginal exams on a patient especially those who are trying to labor without an epidural because often when you have an epidural you are more in the bed sometimes on your side um it's it's more difficult to visualize this purple butt line but i really have seen it a lot when i have patients doing hands and knees sometimes i'm like oh let me take a peek at your purple butt line so purple butt line that's a fun tip for all uh to share with all your friends and something that you can look out for when you're at home too what's our purple butt line doing um, if you mention it to your OB, they may or may not know what you're talking about, but this is kind of more a, a midwife thing based on the studies that I've read about the purple butt line. But yeah, purple butt lines, kind of cool. That is number one. 
So another one that I want to talk with you guys about that we have heard a lot of people experience, both people who have vaginal births and who have cesarean deliveries, people who have epidurals and people who go unmedicated. This is something that we see a lot during the transition stage of labor and also after delivery, and that is incontrollable shaking. These shakes in labor are related to hormone shifts that are going on, they are related to temperature shifts, and they are also related to an adrenaline response that's happening, particularly after labor, once your baby is born. They also can be a response to medications in an epidural or a spinal. They are shakes that are uncontrollable. You can't make them go away. The more you focus on trying not to shake, the worse it gets. But here's the tip I want to share with you, and that is what we can do to help with these shakes. So a warm blanket might help, might trick your brain into kind of uh, calming down the shakes, but something else that can help, especially in the throes of labor um, or immediately postpartum, is there is a pressure point on your foot. I'm gonna insert a little picture here and pressing on that pressure point, me, y'all, pressing on that pressure point on both feet is going to often help with the shakes. Um, I normally kind of go from this angle. So that pressure point right there, giving that a nice firm pressure can really help significantly reduce shakes, which is something that I have found, I just recently started doing this. I did a workshop through evidence-based birth that went through different pressure points and that was the one that has really worked really well and I've shared with my colleagues and their patients have loved it as well. So pressure point on the bottom of your foot to help with shake. So number three. And this is kind of going back to the shakes, the hormone shifts that we have going on. I want to talk with us a little bit about oxytocin. So oxytocin is the hormone that makes you have uterus contractions. It's also a love hormone. And it is a hormone that helps with labor along with other hormones. Obviously, we hear a lot about oxytocin, then we hear about pitocin, which is the synthetic form of oxytocin. If you have a deer in the woods who is laboring, and all of a sudden, they sense danger. There's a predator nearby. Their body will shut off the oxytocin, the adrenaline will rise up, and they will stop labor to go find a safe place to labor. Now, we are not deer, but similar to deer and other mammals, our job is to protect ourselves during the vulnerable time that is labor. So people who are feeling safe and secure and loved are going to labor better and more comfortably because all of our hormones are going to be working in a way than they should that somebody who does not feel safe and secured and loved. And that is why laboring at home for as long as possible, especially if your goal is to not have an epidural and obviously having having clear lines of communication open with your doctor, it's really good because you can feel safe and loved and secure at home more so than you would in a hospital setting. Other things that if you have to be in the hospital, um, I'm not above telling you to go make out with your partner, doing a little bit of nipple stimulation, and I put a sign on your door that says like, we're not gonna come in for 30 minutes, um, and having that conversation with you. So we can give you, I, I, so we're talking about oxytocin, right? It's that love hormone. And sometimes we have to give you the synthetic version of oxytocin, which is pitocin. The synthetic version that we give you only works on your uterus. It only does those contractions on your uterus. It doesn't do that mental part of oxytocin, that love hormone part that helps with pain control and helps with you feeling safe and secure and loved. So sometimes meeting in the middle, if we are doing oxytocin you know, having those close conversations with your partner, showing love with your partner, leaning on your partner, having your partner rub your back, kissing your partner. I know when you think of labor, you don't think of making out with somebody, but I want you to change it and think of labor as you working to bring this baby that you guys both wanted so deeply and desperately into the world, this culmination of love that you are bringing forth. And so having those intimate moments with your partner even if sometimes you have to be in the hospital for the health of you and your baby, can definitely help bring on your own natural oxytocin and help make labor a more enjoyable experience. That brings us to number four. In movies and in TV shows, when women's water breaks, it always breaks before they go into labor, then all of a sudden labor's here in full force and then they start screaming. That's 
not really how it works. So most women without medical intervention, their water breaks in transition. So at about eight centimeters, only one in 10 women have their water break before labor. I was one of those with my first, but it did not happen with my second. And your water doesn't always break during labor. Sometimes your doctor will artificially rupture your membranes to help facilitate labor if we're trying to get things rolling um, at the end when you're pushing. Sometimes when you're pushing your water breaks or sometimes your water doesn't break at all. And that's called a delivery and call. Put a little picture here and there is some mystic things about being born in the call. Your baby will be psychic. Don't Google that um, because there's no studies to support it. It's just a wives tale, but I always, I always tell people, oh my gosh, your baby's gonna be psychic. I've only seen a baby born in call once. It was the coolest thing ever because they don't even realize that they're born. They're still in their little swimming pool and it's awesome. So that's something really crazy and cool that can happen is that your baby can be born in call. Not always, but it can totally happen. But most women, their water breaks at about eight centimeters if it's not ruptured artificially by their midwife or doctor. And also having the conversation to rupture your membranes is one that you wanna not take lightly because when you rupture your membranes, baby has a little bit less cushion, um, you have a little bit less cushion and labor gets a lot more intense. Now, if we are trying to induce your labor, this often is the next logical step. But if your labor is progressing normally, you always can decline having your water broken or have a conversation with your doctor. I'm going to do a video all about patient rights, um, questions to ask when making decisions in labor that should hopefully be coming out later this month or next month. So number five, this one is about your cervix. So, Common misconception, the cervix goes away when you dilate. It doesn't go away. It's not like it just ceases to exist. It's still there. It's just back behind the baby's head. Hold on one second. I'm gonna go get a prop. I'm gonna show you something pretty neat. It's me, I'm back with my prop. Let me put this on. I'll, I'll show you in a second. So cervix in Spanish actually means neck of, of the uterus. Your cervix is a part of your uterus. Your cervix goes over your baby's head and gets pulled back into the rest of the uterus, kind of like putting on a turtleneck sweater. Okay, so I'm a uterus, okay? The whole thing, this is the cervix right up here. So when you are thick and long and close, which you will be sometimes up until labor, a lot of times with your first baby, you're actually gonna thin out before labor, but with subsequent babies, dilation and thinning happen at the same time. So first you kind of start to thin out and then, but you're still close. And then in labor you have dilation and the baby's head is going to keep descending as the cervix goes away behind it and then boom so your cervix doesn't cease to exist it just exists in a different place so speaking of your cervix and your uterus the uterus is this like amazingly cool organ that gets up to 11 times bigger than its initial size during pregnancy okay and then after you deliver, it's not gonna be like in TV and movies where all of a sudden you have flat washboard abs again. Here's what I want you to think of Kate Middleton. After she delivered, she still had a little baby bump. Yes, yeah, she looked fabulous and she had a team of people making her look fabulous. And honestly, I feel for the girl that had to go out immediately after giving birth and pretend that she felt fabulous too. But she still had a little baby bump. You will too. So the process of involution is when your uterus is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and getting back down to its original size. And this takes time because your uterus is going to be between two and three pounds after delivery. It has to go back down to about three ounces. That's going to take six weeks for it to get totally back into your pelvis. So give yourself grace and time when that's happening that things are still gonna look a little bit different. And even once your uterus is back down in your pelvis, it took you nine months to make a baby. So don't give yourself crap if you don't look like you did right before you got pregnant at six weeks postpartum. But during your postpartum stay, you might notice some cramping because your body is still releasing that oxytocin, particularly when you breastfeed, that helps with that involution process, making that uterus smaller. A lot of times you don't notice the cramping with your first baby. It gets worse with every baby though, because your uterus is a little bit more tired. 
Um, so you might be needing more pain control after delivery to help deal with that ibuprofen or sometimes narcotics in the first few hours, few days postpartum to deal with that cramping pain that you have after delivery, particularly with breastfeeding as your uterus is getting smaller. So the next thing I want you to know that's kind of cool about labor is all about vomiting. Most of us don't like to throw up. A lot of us do throw up in labor, sometimes during transition, sometimes before that. But the nice thing about throwing up in labor is it is productive. Now, what I mean by that is that the pressure that you exert when you throw up, you're using those ab muscles. It's a lot of, oh, right? Throwing up, coughing. Those sorts of things are productive in labor. They push baby down. And I honestly have seen women throw up and all of a sudden they're fully dilated. Um, when they were in transition, I've seen women throw up a baby out because you're using those same muscles that you would use to push. I heard a doula say once that throwing up does the work of three contractions. I don't know if this is quantifiably true, but it is anecdotally true. It is something that I say a lot to people because throwing up does work. So while it stinks and it's not fun, and while I do recommend eating lightly in labor, I don't recommend eating anything that you wouldn't want to see again, nothing heavy, nothing greasy, because throwing up is so common, particularly in that last push of labor as your baby is descending, occupying the same kind of area as your lower GI tract, the food that's sitting in your belly has nowhere to go, and so a lot of times it gets pushed up. But often a lot of times with that throwing up, one, it's productive, and two, you feel way better after you do it. So I wouldn't fight it if you're trying to not throw up during labor. I know we all hate it, but you will feel better afterwards. You know, it's one of those things that sometimes happens, and while it sucks, let's think silver lining. Vomiting is productive in labor. So another cool, interesting fact, and something that I just want moms to keep in mind too, your estimated due date. So the due date that the doctor gives you, there are only about 5% of babies that are born on their due date. So when you get your due date, really think of it more as a due month. Give yourself two weeks on either side of that. And then think of your due date as the middle, but also the, the date that your baby is most likely not to be born on. Most first time moms without medical intervention will go to 41 and three weeks gestation. So technically overdue, but if you've given yourself that month, if you've given yourself up into 42 weeks that you're thinking that you could have that baby, it gives you a clearer headspace um, than thinking, oh my gosh, this is my due date, because it's just an estimation. Everybody, cycle is a little bit different so we base our due date on the last menstrual period then often we do an early ultrasound to kind of confirm that but there's still some gray window gray period in like when you actually ovulated with your uh, menstrual cycle so that can kind of account for some differences in due dates and just being aware that it is an estimation let's put the estimation back in estimated due date will give you a lot more peace of mind in knowing that your body is knows what it's doing, it's growing your baby. In the medical community, we don't typically let people go past 42 weeks because that's when we have seen placentas start to deteriorate and we see more um, issues with poor outcomes uh, for babies. So that's why we induce you at 42 weeks. But back in the day, people used to go to 43, 44, like I can't even imagine being that pregnant. More power to those women. But yes, give yourself a month. Your due date, Take that day, go two weeks either side, that's your birth month. You're gonna give birth in that month of time. And then give yourself some grace when you go past your estimated due date and know that you are not alone and that everything is going just as it should and your body is preparing to have a baby. The very last thing that I want you, that is a cool, interesting fact about labor is the fetal ejection reflex. We are bringing it all the way back around. We started with purple butt line and now we're here. So the fetal ejection reflex is caused by the baby entering the birth canal when you are fully dilated and causing strong involuntary pushes and bringing the baby down. You're not doing anything to make it happen, but you also can't do anything to make it not happen. Fetal ejection reflex, we see it kind of both times. You know how I talked about the deer in the woods earlier? So there is some hypothesis that fetal ejection reflex can happen in very late in labor when a woman all of a sudden feels really, really unsafe and it's safer for the baby to just come out than for labor to stop. It also can happen when a woman has a very safe and supported labor. She feels totally uh, disturbed and just lets the baby come down and kind of doesn't give in to that urge to push until the baby's right there. One or two strong contractions later and the baby is 
birth very, very quickly. Um, I have seen this happen a couple of times and it has been amazing and awe-inspiring to see it's those moments where the doctor doesn't have time to put the gloves on before the baby's born and um, it might be the doctor catches the baby without gloves or the nurse is the one that catches the baby or sometimes the baby is already born before we even get in there um so the fetal ejection reflex is something that is really cool to witness it's really cool that our bodies do it and some people even when they're fully dilated like to just wait and let their body passively move the baby down and wait for that fetal ejection reflex to take over and bring the baby the rest of the way out during this time when this fetal ejection reflex is occurring it's really important that we listen to moms and let them listen to their bodies as they birth their babies into a peaceful and calm environment those are 10 cool weird funky things that i wanted you guys to know about labor definitely let me know if there's any others that you can think of down below let me know what you've learned what was the coolest thing that i talked about thanks so much for watching bye guys